Okay, chapter 14 is on the parliamentary systems, as they will be compared to presidential systems, which is the kind of system that the United States has. Keep in mind that the next quiz, which is quiz number six, will cover chapters 14 and 15, and that will be due on Wednesday, the 23rd of November next week, the day before Thanksgiving, so keep that in mind. We want to maintain the schedule. So the uh, next quiz will be due by next Wednesday on chapters 14 and 15, Parliamentary Systems and Presidential Systems. Chapter 15 lecture notes will be posted right after this one. Keep in mind that a parliament is a also a broad generic term for a legislative body. In the United States, our legislative body is called Congress. In other countries, it's called Parliament. So let's look at the main differences. Again, the parliament is just the elected body of representatives. And you may have heard this term MPs. Well, that's not military police. That's members of parliament. Somebody in, United, in the United Kingdom that you may have heard them referred to as an MP. That's what that means. It's the form of government in about half of all democracies in the world. And the one that we'll be referring to occasionally is Great Britain's House of Commons, considered the lower house of their government. And the bills passed by the parliament are law. And so we'll see the major differences here between the parliament systems and the presidential systems is that the parliament has pretty much total control, particularly the, the majority party or the coalition government, because there is no president that will be signing the bills. The prime minister is the leader of the majority party and has the majority party and the prime minister have considerable control over government while they're in power. The executive power of a parliament is the cabinet that is selected by the ruling coalition, somewhat different from the, the cabinet that is appointed by the U.S. president and has to be approved by the Senate. Here the cabinet is pretty much put together immediately by the ruling coalition. Here's a map right out of the book, figure 14.1, showing in dark blue here the parliamentary systems around the world, Canada, Great Britain, much of Europe, India, Australia, South Africa. So as you can see, several of the former British colonies are parliamentary systems. We'll talk about presidential systems in the next chapter, which is the United States and much of South America. And there are some systems that have a parliament and a president that are sharing power, such as Russia and uh, France, a couple of other countries out there worth noting that we'll talk about perhaps later. And of course, there's lots of countries out there that are not a democracy, as we've already talked about before. Now, the cabinet runs the operations of government, and it takes the lead in the policy. So the cabinet in a parliamentary system has quite a bit more controlling power. They are running the show, so to speak. They are the administrative body of the ruling party that is one control of the parliament formed by the majority party members of parliament. And as we already talked about, if no party has a majority, then a coalition forms that would maintain the majority control of that parliament. And the leader of this coalition is called the prime minister, such as uh, in some of these cases that we've already talked about, or chancellor in some systems, or premier in other systems. But they are the... Uh, the heads of the government because of the fact that their party was elected control of the parliament. Now the cabinet retains its power as long as there are confidence in that government, which means it commands a majority. And there's a few reasons why the government could fall. You may have heard that term to where the government is falling. So this is where the, the, there's a crease in the coalition and it ceases to, to agree and the coalition spit, splits. So therefore, nobody has majority control of the 
of the government, and that so the government could fall and result in new elections or a new coalition forming. The majority could potentially shift. So what's happening here is the the coalition that's in control of the government is not what was originally intended when it was first formed. So there's something going on that is causing problems and therefore another way of putting it, losing confidence in that ruling body. And there could be a vote to unseat the cabinet, which could result in uh, falling government or lack of uh, confidence in government, or the cabinet could resign for some reason. So the head of the government is the majority party's leader. We've talked about that before when we looked at proportional representation systems where you're typically voting for a party list, and then if that party becomes the majority, then the head of that party will become the prime minister, the head of government, directs the business of the state, and they would continue to sit in parliament for as long as there is confidence, or if there is a constitution that says that the, the elections will uh, reoccur at a certain time, then that could possibly be uh, the system as well. The parliament can take a vote of no confidence, which would then spur a new election. The prime minister is also the leader of the cabinet. He has the right to disband parliament and force a new election. Now, we have a fairly recent example of this when Tony Blair in Great Britain stepped down in 2007 due to the lack of confidence over the Iraq war primarily. And then the party selected at that time a new prime minister, Gordon Brown, because Blair knew that confidence had been lost in the, in the uh, ruling party and decided to step down, which then spurred a new election. So the parliament system, the ruling coalition or the ruling party has a lot of power. And really they, they have the opportunity to pass the legislation that they said they were going to pass. There's nobody really stopping them, as we'll see here in a minute. And so as long as they have rule, ruling control over the parliament, they can continue to pass policies that they were intending to do when they got elected. And then if that falls apart, then that would inspire a new election, a new coalition, perhaps even another party in control. Now, as again, the uh, cabinet is the dominant factor of this parliament because it is put together by the ruling party. And it proposes legislation with debate and puts on the minor amendment. So as you can see, the, the party has quite a bit of power in this system if they are the majority control of the parliament. Now, the this is different somewhat from the presidential system, which has to, the party in control of Congress has to deal with the president's agenda. And if the party of the president is different from the party of Congress, then you have divided government and there may be more difficulty getting legislation passed because the president has one agenda, Congress may have a different agenda. So part of this party power is that it determines who the leaders are. Yes, the, the uh, prime minister, obviously, is the head of government because he's the head of that party that we're in control of. And as we've said before, in these proportional representation multi-party systems, such as in Great Britain, the party is more of a farm team for government to where it provides an, an avenue for advancing up to up the ranks through uh, party power. And again, this requires, if you have a coalition that's running the government, it requires a committed coalition because as soon as that commitment falls apart, then, then you have lost confidence in the government, governing body, and then that could result in a major shift, even a new, potentially a new election. Here's some examples of how much control that the cabinet has in the parliament. For example, 
This uh, count was made in 2006, 2007 in the Britain's Parliament. 97% of the bills submitted to the House of Commons were approved. That is extraordinarily different than the U.S. system. In the U.S. system, as we'll see, it's the committees that start to uh, hash out these bills and try to get them put together so that it gets out on the floor of Congress. Well, we, knew, we do know that about 90% of all the bills that are initially submitted to Congress fail before they even get out of a committee. So as you can see right here, the cabinet is controlling legislation and literally they're not even going to propose a bill if it's not going to get approved virtually. So they're, they're making policy and approving it as they're making it, so to speak. Looking at the number of amendments that are added to the bills in this particular count right here, virtually almost 100%, that's only two out of 1,772 amendments, the, only two of them were not approved that were proposed by the cabinet. So therefore, as you can see, since the cabinet has control of this legislative body, they're not even going to propose an amendment that they don't know that they don't think it's going to be part of the bill. And uh, only 210 of over 4,000 amendments proposed by other members, that is members of parliament that are not part of the, the ruling coalition, so a very small percentage of those amendments in the past. So it, this provides an interesting contrast between our system, and we complain a lot about our two-party system, but as you can see in a system like this, you're voting for the party, and if the party's controlling parliament, well, they're going to do exactly what they're, they were saying that they were going to do in order to get elected, because there's very little opposition. Now, the head of state is a... In, this, in these parliamentary type systems is typically a separate and more, mostly a symbolic figure, such as a king or a queen, queen of England, for example. These are typically referred to as constitutional monarchs, and they mostly are symbolic and ceremonial. We see some countries, Britain, Denmark, Spain, Netherlands, have these constitutional monarchs that are pretty much symbolic and do not have a whole lot of power on policy making. Now, in some of these parliamentary systems, the president is considered more of a symbolic figure and does not hold a lot of power, such as in Germany and in Italy. And then in some of these mixed systems, as we have uh, mentioned before, for example, in Russia, well, it depends on who the power player is. For example, in Russia, Putin if he's the prime minister, he's in power, and then if he decides to move over to president, he's in power there. Uh, that's signs of an authoritarian system in the making where president, or either president or prime minister Putin could be there for life. So what the head of state typically does is carry out these ceremonial functions with very little political power. Now, I apologize for the, 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 the fuzzy haziness on this little graph here, but this was a very useful little graph that shows the major difference between the parliamentary system here and the presidential system here. Despite being un unable to read some of this stuff, you can see that in a parliamentary system, the voters elect the parties who are going to control parliament. So here's your coalition that's controlling parliament. And then the cat in the party selects the uh, prime minister, who is the head of the party, and their cabinet. And so, therefore, there's your ruling body right there. And then they guide the ministries in the administrative functions of government. But the control is up here with the prime minister and cabinet. Now, with the presidential system, which we'll talk about in the next chapter, the voters elect both the parliament, which we call Congress, and the president, as you can see with these arrows here, the voters are electing both of them. And you have the, uh, the checks and balances between these two branches. And in this case, the president is choosing or appointing his cabinet, which then actually has to be approved 
by Congress. And then the cabinet and the departments, they carry out the administrative functions of government. But you have considerably more checks and balances and separation of powers here because the voters are electing the president and the parliament separately to this one covering the legislative branch, this one covering the executive branch. So as you can see, the parliamentary system, it's uh, you're voting for a party, the party controls parliament, then they select their cabinet, which is controlling the day-to-day -day function and policy making of government. Some of the other functions, the parliament has the debate. In fact, the debate is fairly colorful in these type of systems because uh, it's kind of an art. The bills evolve through this debate. Again, the, the ruling coalition is going to have exclusive power, but the, uh, the opposition can definitely influence what they're proposing. And so some of the debate gets quite heated and colorful, but it's all part of the process and uh, bills evolve as a result. The uh, parliament also provides scrutiny over the amendments that are that are proposed because they, there has to be some, some amount of persuasion to put these amendments in, and that's where the opposition party can help persuade whether or not they get in or how they're shaped. Much like Congress in the United States, the parliament has an oversight function. The entire body can certainly keep a critical eye on the cabinet. And again, the parliament provides the source for the executive offices because it all kind of comes out of the same system. Now, the committees in parliament, this is another interesting contrast. The committees in parliament do not have the strength or the independence that the U.S. Congress does. And as we'll see here uh, in the next chapter, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the legislative branch as well. But the U.S. congressional committees have considerable power in shaping policy, fine-tuning it, honing it, getting out into the chamber. As we said before, the vast majority of bills fail to even get out of committee. So there's a lot of work that's going on in the committees. However, the cabinet does the bulk of that job in the parliamentary system. Because otherwise, if you put it on to the burden of committees, this would weaken the central unity of the cabinet. And that's the, the most powerful feature of this parliament system, is that if you elect a party to be majority control, then they build their cabinet and then they control government with uh, not a whole lot of opposition to speak of. In Britain, these committees are typically ad hoc committees that are set up temporarily for each bill as it comes in. So, so they're not permanent standing committees like we have in the United States. These are put together, and they're not put together in every case. They're just set up if it feels like that there needs to be a, a committee to review a bill, and they do not have the same power that the U.S. committees have that can hold hearings and subpoena witnesses. The parliamentary the Parliament committees do not do this, and they do not have permanent staff. So that's a pretty big difference between the Parliament systems and the presidential systems that have a Congress to where the committees do the bulk of this work. Now, the upper houses, here's another, another major difference. In the parliamentary systems, the upper houses have very little political power. They're, they're usually appointed, even symbolic or ceremonial. In the case of the Britain system, the upper house is called the House of Lords, and they are appointed members, usually uh, for political reasons and uh, or ceremonial reasons or even reasons of prestige or whatever, but they do not have much power. They can delay a bill. If there is some serious opposition to a bill that the, that the House of Commons is planning on uh, proposing, they could potentially delay that bill, but only for a year, perhaps maybe even allowing for some rethinking on the bill or some amendments or whatever. But 
the House of Commons, which is the elected body of Parliament, can pass the bill a year later without the House of Lords' consent. Again, this is a, another big difference from the U.S. system of Congress, where our Senate, which is the upper house, cons has considerably more prestige than our lower house, which is the House of Representatives. The uh, Senate has quite a bit more freedom to debate bills and uh, has the power to filibuster bills. So clearly the, the Senate, which is the upper house in the United States, has quite a bit of power, whereas the upper houses in parliamentary systems do not. So another interesting distinction. Now, the advantages of the parliamentary systems, we've already discussed a lot of it because the power is unified. If you are elected to be control of the government, well, you've got unified power to do what you say you are going to do. The party's in power. Now they can, they can do their agenda. Whereas in the, in the United States, if a president gets elected on a certain agenda, he still has to rely on Congress to pass those bills that he has signed. And if he's got a divided government, that Congress is not going to have a whole lot of motivation to pursue his agenda. Whereas here, there's no president to veto it, and a court can't strike it down. This is another interesting feature in most parliamentary systems, are there, although we are seeing some shifts in this, as we'll see here in a minute, don't have that power of judicial review where the court can strike down a bill. So the responsibility is very clear in these parliamentary systems. And as a result, you can't shift the blame. Voters know exactly who to blame. And if they and if they lose faith or lose confidence, then the government could fall apart and a new election could put in another power, another party in power. Whereas in the United States system, we have lots of blame to go around. Everybody can point fingers at another branch. We can say, oh, let's let's appoint judges to pass pass policy by striking down laws, or let's delegate this to the president so that we can blame him if it goes wrong. Or the president can say, I can't do anything because my hands are tied because Congress won't give me any bills. So lots of blame to go around in our U.S. congressional system and very clear responsibility in the parliamentary systems. Now the disadvantages, the, the minority party does not have a whole lot of protections they could get pretty much just uh, a run roughshod over until something occurs that could potentially put them back in power such as with the uh, with a war that goes badly or an economic meltdown yes that typically uh, evokes change in almost any system they're they're not really able to slow down hasty action in a parliamentary system and uh, even if it uh, did not have broad support, it could get uh, put through. Now, this is a potential advantage in the U.S. congressional system is that it is more deliberative. It might take longer and more incremental to get policy out. And here, you, if you have a party in power, they could put a lot of policy into play because they can. And then when that... If that government fails down the road, you could have a lot of retraction of policy because, you know, a lot of it was pushed through perhaps a little hastily. And, of course, we've already talked about the potential for an unstable government if there's a coalition that needs to be in place for a majority. And uh, that coalition could fracture along those party lines. So, and we've already talked about how some countries, such as Italy, have had many different coalitions over the past decades. <clears throat> now, the book talks about the consensus parliament, parliament systems, and this is uh, somewhat of a hybrid that tries to bring up some advantages of, all, of both systems as far as president and parliament. These are more uh, prevalent in neo-corporate estates where they're trying to get the business sector a little bit more incorporated into policymaking or proportional representation election systems. So as we've already talked about a little bit with the neocorporatist uh, form of interest groups, that there's more emphasis on negotiation and compromise among the parties so that 
one majority party doesn't have so much control and also using part of the political process through royal commissions to where the head of state or the the royal side can actually have a little bit more say through appointed commissions and recommendation on policy and uh, so also the with the consensus systems you're seeing policy that is potentially more consistent with the changes in the cabinet however just as we've already talked about with the US congressional system if you start spreading it out a little bit more as far as who's involved in the process then there's more difficulty to accept accountability or to prevent pointing of fingers and blaming other people so then again that's this that's the trade-off uh, it that goes right back to the authoritarian versus dem democratic systems democratic systems are messy because people have their say and leaders are held accountable authoritarian systems the leader can do whatever he wants doesn't really matter may not even care about criticism but of course they are not as typically successful as a result of that Germany is a consensus parliament system that the book talks about a few more checks and balances again the upper house given a little bit more power to appoint uh, to be appointed by the state government so they're they're using more of a federalist type system here to help appoint their upper house and the upper house is now able to block bills rather than just delay them Germany has also allowed the process of judicial review to where you could potentially strike down the courts could strike down a bill if it is deemed unconstitutional and starting to see a few more standing committees to scrutinize bills rather than the cabinet having total control over it and again you've got the possibility here where the ruling party is not going to be held as responsible so that could be a uh, you know again another trade-off as to sharing of power but yet getting a little bit more messy as to who to hold accountable and then one more thing here their authoritarian parliament systems they the book talks about China's National People's Congress since it is authoritarian a, a uh, I guess you could say an evolution of the Communist Party pretty much in name since it is kind of a controlled capitalist system but China's People's Congress is not an elected body you have to be a member of the Communist Party which we've talked about a little bit before and in the uh, single party authoritarian systems and so therefore you got to be a member of the club so to speak and very selective and very secretive and in China the People's Congress meets only once a year for two weeks and then every few years they will secretly elect a new leader and of course bills will always pass and appointments are always approved in this authoritarian parliament of course we do not necessarily see or know how that is done that it's just uh, because it's done behind closed doors amongst the uh, very uh, include uh, I guess you could say exclusive party members but they do allow some occasion for debate and feedback however not a whole lot through a independent press or through a democratic uh, voting process a referendum process or even a petition uh, uh, type process it's also done somewhat internally now the authoritarian parliament also particularly in China provides a symbol of a unified nation and even though there is unrest and perhaps even growing unrest in China because of the authoritarian system it is a fairly homo hom homogenous culture and uh, is if their economy continues to improve, improve and they feel like that the leaders are making good decisions economically as far as the future of the country 
they may be able to quell some unrest. It'll be an interesting situation to see how China evolves with a, an authoritarian system and a, in a, under a controlled capitalist system. Okay, so again, chapters 14 and 15 will be uh, covered on the next quiz on uh, November 23rd. So chapter 15 will be posted immediately after this one, and I'll give you a little bit of uh, feedback on what to focus on for, for the quiz.